Do you know this is where we went into the market tunnel when you're finished? Weekend before Thanksgiving. Oktoberfest. Oh, you know what they must do? Oh, Oktoberfest. Oh, that's fun. Go to Germany, 1877. It was called the drive because this wood stove right here is kept burning 24-7, seven, seven days a week. Most of the time that they worked here, they ran two 10-hour two shifts six days a week. These guys only got Sunday off. Now most of the, about half the miners I'll say that came here to work, came from Europe. They came from Wales, Scotland, Cornwall, England. They came from Eastern Europe and Italy. Most of the people got into mining back in these days, got into it generationally. It's what their father had done, what their father's father had done. Now these guys can make pretty good money. Is that any time you cut into that rock, it lets off the silica dust, a very fine dust. If you look at it under a magnifying glass, it looks like tiny glass shards. And this dust would get into the lungs of the miners and start a disease called silicosis. It would start hardening their lungs from the bottom up. And over their career working as a miner, they would lose more and more lung capacity until eventually they become so ill that something as simple as a common cold would cause them to expire. So the mining, five to 40 years. The average lifespan for an American not in the mining industry was 50 to 55 years. They were giving up a good portion of their life to take care of their families. Now also the sons of miners were hired to work here. They were paid 60 cents a day. They worked uh, as snippers, runners, and powder monkeys. As snippers, they just did odd jobs out here on the surface. As powder monkeys, their first job would be to take a box like this full of dynamite, 50 pounds of dynamite, and they take that dynamite and get it ready for a distribution. Now these miners were really great at reusing things up here. They're very economical. Once they had the dynamite out of the box like this, they'd have a box just full of sawdust. Well, the powder monkeys would hand it over to the runners, and it was up to runners to make good use of that box. You guys have any idea how they might use a box full of sawdust in a mine? In years, it's been in 1860. And at the time, it's made of 50% nitroglycerin and 50% gunpowder. Well, the, uh, it, stays in mine, it stays in about 43 degrees inside that mine year round. Well, the, uh, the, di the nitroglycerin, it starts freezing at 52 degrees. And because of all the tool, even just loud talk, you can set it off. So the miners, they just start putting it down their shirts, you know, use a little body heat. I seem like a good idea. But the problem was that when we get up about 96 degrees, that nitroglycerin starts gassing off. You get onto the skins of the miners and into their bloodstream. 
Well, we know today how doctors will, will prescribe just a tiny amount of nitroglycerin to clear the blood of a heart patient. This is just thinking right out of existence. Pour more water in over the top. Now this bottom chamber here is empty, it's hollow. They can set this down over a candle inside of mine, and that's how they can keep the dynamite stable until they're ready to use it. And also, should one of those runners here charged with uh, distributing these uh, uh, boxes throughout the mine, if they ever let this uh, wood stove go out, mine manager's office, an engineer named Dr. Poli came out from Lebanon, New York in 1870 to take charge of this operation. Well, you know, back in 1849, they struck guns coming up here. There were over 400 miles cut just in the Georgetown area alone. Well, when the, when the gold miners got up here, they started seeing... Right. But, but the reason that train was fought up here was to serve these silver mines. Okay, now one thing. Oh. Uh, all right, Miner Larry. Everybody else like carrying Larry, are you a miner or a miner? Well, this is a clear indicator that water has passed through some of that silver and lead ore, it's dissolved some of it, and deposited right here on the wall of the tunnel. Now, had this happened while the miners were here, they would most definitely have gotten cutting through that wall to go find that ore, because this is a very clear indicator that somewhere behind that wall, probably up above a little bit, because water works its way downhill, there's some still some silver and lead ore in the caves and tunnels. And they believe that the dragons would protect anything of value inside the mountain as their own property. That's why they In Blackhawk? Yes, there was, there was one in Denver and one in Blackhawk. I know there are a lot in Denver. There are like 20 or 20. Okay. Well, I didn't know there were yeah. that many. <laughs> now, lunch rooms like this were set up throughout the mine. The primary reason for that is that the mine operators, again, they want to stop that high grading. So they require the miners to stay inside the mine for their entire 10 hour shift. Now, most of, I mentioned a lot of these miners came from Europe. Many of them came from Cornwall, England. These fellows from Cornwall brought with them the Cornish lunch pail. This was universally used up here. Most of the miners lived in boarding houses, and the people were filled with things that they could access during the day to soothe their throats. Tobacco, hard candies, and dried fruits. Now, the second portion of the bucket was generally filled with either a stew or what was most popular was a breaded meat pie called a pasty. The miners liked this pasty because they could hold on to the edge of the bread crust and eat their lunch without getting it from their hands into the food. They didn't want to eat it. Well, back uh, they had rats living here in the mine, and uh, the, the, but uh, the rats were good for two things. One, they could sense if the air quality was going bad, and two, they could sense if there was a rock wall or ceiling that was under pressure. If the miners saw the rats run away, the miners knew they needed to just go find another place in the mine to work for a while. Well, as you can imagine, though, 
that uh, rat population gets to be a little bit much from time to time. And uh, to control that, they can rub that bread crust they've been feeding them onto the rock walls and get a lot of that silica dust into it before they feed it to them. And that's how they could control the rat population. We filled with a concoction of gin and molasses. Oh <laughs> they had a number of names for it. They generally oh. called it yuck. <laughs> About an hour before they'd break for lunch, they could hang their buckets up over their candles, and that way they could enjoy a warm lunch. Now, I'd like to tell you guys a little bit about how they do this hand drill here. First hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry, she needs to darling. Grandma, get the camera. <laughs> down here a little bit. Right there on your right shoulder. Now, Lily's my shaker. I'm the striker. It's my job to hit this drill 60 to 90 times a minute, just as hard as I can. It's Lilith's job to turn the drill every time I hit it to keep it from getting stuck in the rock. Well, I'm back here just pounding away, pounding away. And this room is full of other miners. There might be another 60 miners in here. It's making a lot of noise, a lot of dust. And remember, we're working by candlelight. Well, I'm back here just pounding away, pounding away, pounding away. And Lily, she's going to tell me from time to time that maybe I need to stop hitting the drill because maybe it's gone dull and we need to change it out. Maybe she needs to clean out that hole. How do you think Lily gets my attention? To quit hitting that drill. Kick it. You know, that's the answer I get most frequently. <laughs> but what she'd actually do, she'd quickly slide her hand back and put a thumb over the end of that drill. Block off that little bit of light from me. And hopefully I'm going to see that real quick before I swing again. Otherwise, I'm going to liable to break her thumb. And if I don't duck real fast, she's, she's liable to turn around and break my nose. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. You done good. Before. And they're considering them a benevolent group of ghosts trying to keep people out of harm's way. Although some people think that Tommy is actually the spirit of the mountain itself, and the mountain really doesn't like having holes cut in it. And these are the people who blame Tommy knockers on playing tricks on the miners, like moving their tools, tripping them, dropping rocks on their heads. But most people love around here know Tommy knockers to be a benevolent group of ghosts. I will tell you, we most definitely have Tommy knockers here in the mine. And if you go to the uh, into Silver Plume or Georgetown. Many of the homes that were built during this era still have Tommy knockers living in them. Three of the historic buildings in downtown Georgetown still have ghosts living in them. But as I say, they're generally a benevolent group of ghosts. They don't cause any trouble. Every now and then they'll startle someone in the middle of the night. But uh, they're known to be a pretty good group of guys. Uh, the word Tommy knocker comes from two words. Tommy's just a slang term for a miner. If you didn't know his name, he's just a Tommy. And the knocking comes from the fact that if you have a rock wall or ceiling that's under pressure, it starts making a knocking sound. And the closer it gets to failure, the more frequent and the louder that knocking sound will, will become. Well, these superstitious miners actually believed that there was a ghost back there knocking on that wall, warning them to go work in another area until that wall would collapse. But today, we just know it as geologic pressure. Well, now, last summer, at, uh, at the back of the Everett mine, uh, that ceiling started making that knocking sound. Well, after a couple of days, we sent in a crew with uh, pry bars to bring it on down. And when they went in, they, they met two, two Tommy knockers in there. One of them was named New York. I guess that's where he was from, just his nickname, I guess. But one of the people who went in with, uh, on our team was a young high school boy, happened to be named Tommy. He had long, blonde, curly hair down on his shoulders. And New York, well, he didn't like Tommy. He just mm -hmm. didn't like anything about him. I think it was that long hair. He even called him a word that we're not accustomed to using today. He called him a shrill. And as easy as it is to look up things today, I'm going to let you guys look that up on your own. Let you find out what he called him. <laughs> Anybody got any questions for me? Well, folks, have gone pretty Yeah, short. what's a shrill? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid to tell you I might upset somebody. Of the space. Well, this is where they hit the heart of the Morning Star Lode. There's been a ballroom created from a removal of ore up above. It extends 200 feet vertically. It runs 170 feet with ore. You notice that your feet are the tracks of the ore cars. They run the, the ore straight into the cars and run it straight out to the mill. Well, after they had mined this area up above, they wanted to see if this vein continued down below this level, and sure enough, it did. And again, what appears to be a puddle of water with a ladder going down in it is a vertical circulation feature called the winds. This one goes down to the lowest level of the mine, 120 feet down.
Back in the day when they were working here, they had this pneumatic wind copper oxidizes green. If you'd like to touch it down here where I'm flashing my light, you're more than welcome. We consider that sacrificial material. Find out what a slag pot slag might feels like. Love people. They love contact. <laughs> that was a good tour. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. They ran into each other and rock throwing and name calling ensued, and they had to have a lawsuit which ended in favor of the Everett Tunnel because they could prove that they started mining that vein first. So these are basically both of the pieces valued at $200 million worth of silver. That's in 19th century money. Today's money is $5.36 billion worth of silver. That is a lot of silver, folks. The name Georgetown came from George Griffith. And the name of Silver Blue Silver found in all the mines in this area. And air compressor. Our jackhammers in the mine clear until 1942 when supposedly the residents of Georgetown were tired of listening to it. If you look up from those tracks across the valley, you ought to be able to see a little bit more. We are re-entering the loop portion of the railroad. These features allow the railroad grade to stick at about 2.5%. It's necessary because though the two towns, Georgetown, Silver Blue, paperwork, anything small, little children, the light can get a little gusty up here, and if it grabs anything away from you, it will be below 100 feet down to Clear Creek below us, or 75 feet down to the road or tracks. When the Devil's Gate Hybrid was built, it was one of five loop features in the world, folks, and the only one to feature a bridge. That is what made it a scenic marvel of the 19th century. Off to your right is a lovely view of Jackson Mountain looming over the town of Georgetown there. What made it an engineering marvel is if you take a close look at the bridge, it lies on a curve and a grade. It is not quite flat, it lies over a 1% grade. At the time it was built, it was one of two bridges in the world of its length of two, uh, 300 feet, that is, out of a American football field. We suggest you cruise on up to the end of the parking lot to take a peek at that before you go. Our locomotive today is the Westside Bloom and Lumber Company, number nine, Tuolumne County, California. There's another 200 to go all the way into Georgetown there, folks. And at this time, for those of you that joined us in Devil's Gate, I regret to inform you we are approaching the end of our journey this afternoon. On behalf of History Colorado and all of us here at Georgetown Loop, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Already folks, the train is stopped and secured. It's now safe to navigate your way through the train and disembark.